Welcome everybody. Lovely to see you all again. Um, so my name is Justine Clark. I'm a co-founder and director of Parla. Um, and this series, Light at the End of the Tunnel, is a collaboration between Parla and Monash Architecture. Um, many of you will know that normally my colleague Naomi Stead is here with me, uh, but today I'm representing Monash as well as Parla. So we acknowledge the traditional owners of country across Australia's many nations and we recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. In particular, we acknowledge the people of the Greater Kulin Nations who are the traditional custodians of the lands on which Monash operates and on which I'm speaking to you from today. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and to the Indigenous Australians who are part of the Pala community. So welcome to the 16th session, four months of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, our series looking at architecture as a profession, a discipline, a practice, and we're particularly interested in how it is and will be affected by the pandemic and how we might um, find our way through into the end of this tunnel and um, how the place on the other side might be, um, you know, how we might influence what that is like uh, for the better. So today's session's on procurement. I have to say this is the most popular session we've had so far, which... Um, <laughs> Is very interesting in itself. Um, this is a very timely matter. Only this morning um, John Held pointed out on Twitter that poor procurement leads to poor outcomes in terms of quality and is, a is tightly connected to fee cutting and of course from a parlour perspective this is all bad for equity. Today however we want to focus on what we can do about this not bemoan the problems. Where can architects and practices find leverage? How can we affect the way that work is procured? And we've got Jeff Hanmer and Kate Fitzgerald here to help us think about these questions. Um, we're also joined by Ilana Rasbash, who is a um, graduate here in Melbourne. Ilana is the person who suggested this topic to us following our last open mic session. And I was very, very pleased that she's agreed to join me as co-host of the session. And she's going to introduce the topic and the speaker topic in a little bit more detail and the speakers shortly. But first, for those of you who've been here before, you know there's some protocols. Um, for those of you who haven't been to one of these events, well, special welcome. Um, please make sure your microphone's on mute unless you're actually speaking. Um, but we'd really like it if you can leave your camera on if you'd like to do that. It's really great to have a sense of um, connection across you know, the internet um, and to see your faces and to kind of feel like we're part of an event. So these are very informal events, um, but they're also aimed to be very informative. Alana and I are going to ask questions throughout, um, but we also take questions from the floor. So if you've got a question, please put that into the chat function. Um, we'll be keeping an eye on that, and my, my colleague Susie in particular is, is looking at that um, and identifying questions that kind of work well with the flow. Um, and what we'll do then is ask you to put on your camera, if you can, um, and put that question to the speakers yourself. Um, if you can't do that, that's fine, let us know. Just make a note in the chat and we can read it out ourselves. But it's really lovely to actually hear your voices, see your faces and be part of that conversation. Um, so, great. Now I'm going to um, remember to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to throw to Alana to uh, introduce the topic in more detail. Thanks so much for that introduction, Justine, and the opportunity to co-host today's conversation. Um, there's a lot of focus on procurement in the present moment um, and in remaking the workplace, but can we rethink the way that work is procured and the way that buildings are brought into the existence? On today's panel, we have Kate Fitzgerald, who is the director of Whispering Smith a staunchly feminist practice located in South Fremantle. She is on the WA Committee of the Association of Consulting Architects and a passionate advocate for gender equity in architecture and better design. Kate has been involved in the design WA planning system reforms, as well as representing better architectural businesses through the ACA's Business of Small Practice Forum. Jeff Hanmer is a practicing architect an adjunct professor in, in architecture at the University of Adelaide, a writer and a historian of construction. He has been the managing director of ARENA, 
since it was founded as WHP Architects in 1987. ARENA now focuses on managing, on focuses on facilities for the education sector in Australia and around the world. Their services include strategic and, and master planning, working on both the client and delivery side of projects. So in order to really hone in on procurement, we would like to establish a couple of parameters to frame today's discussion for both our speakers and audience questions, which are to come and really welcome in the chat. The first assumption, and this follows on nicely from last week's event, is that architects have already improved their communication skills and are able to value, express the value of their services and with that also the value of good design. Secondly, architects are therefore able to now invoice for their professional services with the same dignity as other consulting and essential professions. And lastly, clients have a secure understanding of this and whether such changes have occurred at an industry or an individual practice level isn't really critical for today's conversation. So let's throw to our speakers now. Why should architects look at procurement? Who would like to start? Kate, do you want to lead off? I would actually really like to hear what you have to say about this first, Jeff, if you don't mind. Okay. <laughs> I'm very interested to hear it, please. Well, it, no, this is, this is really important because um, if we think about the history of our firm, it's been driven by the evolution of the firm. It's been driven by uh, the evolution of different markets. And essentially, for instance, in the mid-90s, we had um, a practice which we loved, which was doing um, lots of childcare and community buildings. And uh, in 1996, John Howard um, came into government and within two years, he had destroyed all of the funding mechanisms for community childcare, which was essentially delivered through local councils. And, and so we had to get out of the market, which we, we, didn't, we didn't really want to do. We'd spent, um, we'd spent roughly speaking eight years learning how to do decent childcare centres and we ended up uh, doing a lot of them, but we, there was no market. So we just, we just had to reconfigure the firm to focus on other things. And again, in our current situation, where um, uh, most of our work was in the higher education sector, which is, as you probably are well aware, has just collapsed. So we um, are going to have to reconfigure our firm yet again to, to make sense in the current marketplace. Now, I think, you know, one of the, my casual observations is that often when firms are faced with adverse market conditions, um, they, uh, they don't react. And uh, I think what one of the, the things about architecture for me is that if we look at architects through history, we realise how different their roles have, have been. So how, how different our current role as architects is to say, uh, Christopher Wren, uh, his role as an architect. So, you know, Christopher Wren, not only did he design buildings, he also organised their construction and actually was responsible for paying people who were doing work on his sites. So he was sort of a combination of master builder and architect rolled into one. If we look back to Palladio, you can't really interpret Palladio without understanding Count Trissino and their relationship, um, personal and, and, and um, financial. And, and, and so we look at the 18th century, we see a different model for architects, 19th century, different model, 20th century, uh, a different model. And, and I suppose really since about 1980, when I first entered practice, uh, we've seen changes again, which I think um, you know, aren't, aren't all for the good, but in, in some ways we've, we've got to come up with, with ways of responding to these changes as, as profession. So we rarely talk about these sorts of things. Um, as Justine was just saying, 
um, before the meeting started, architects just tend to whinge and moan about the, the nasty things that happen to them, and that's that's true. So we're we're not trying today to to whinge and moan. Um, we want to think about ways that we can improve uh, procurement to deliver better results. So I think one of my key focuses here will be to talk about how government procures architects, because still government is a major player in the market. And I think the trends in procurement by government, that's both local, state and federal, have been rather negative over the past uh, 20 years. And uh, I think um, we need to as a profession, lobby governments to change this. Um, and that's really, I suppose, one of the key things that I'd like to achieve through both the AIA and the ACA. So I think that's... Katie, is that enough of a, of a summary? Does that, that kick it off for you? Spot on. Terrific. <laughs> I think it's always good to hear from a really experienced practitioner at the beginning of the conversation. What you mean it's, to say is old. It gives a really good yeah, that's right. <laughs> good overall. This is what's happened <laughs> over, over the last, you know, I've only got a short 10 year time frame where so much has happened. Um, so it's good to hear that. Um, possibly for us at Whispering Smith, um, we're a largely residential focused firm, but we have done quite a bit of um, commercial work over our, over our history. And we have also done a bit of uh, consulting work with government as part of the um, new medium density planning policy. Uh, and we also, you know, um, decided to dabble in developments because we actually think that there is a future for the profession without clients where we become the clients because we're a lot more economically savvy than we have been in the past. Um, and I think that, that that's something that we, as an alternative method of procuring, are really... Um, working towards. Um, and I think that the, proc the procurement matters to us um, because if we, aren't, if we aren't enjoying the working relationship that we have with our clients and with our projects, that um, all the other facets of, of, the prof of, of our practice, um, our mental health, you know, how are we going? If we're not, if we're sort of arguing and, and the jobs aren't going well and we're not, we're, we've been forced into an awful procurement process, uh, that's going to affect our profit margins. It's going to affect our ability to pay maternity leave or paternity leave. Uh, it's, it, it, it works right through into the very, you know, fibre of the practice. And so at Whispering Smith, we have, um, we have a bit of a policy, I guess, and we, we, it, we just don't work for ourselves. We'd rather have the day off. Um, and I think that, you know, sorry if I'm not allowed to say that word, Justine, you're um... around. <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> but it, it's, it's <laughs> uh, like recently we were, we sat down to meet uh, some clients for the first time. And when they walked out of the room, my graduate just turned and went, mm -mm, no, we're not doing it. And I was like, okay, mate, look, it's COVID. You know, we're trying to, we're coming out of a fairly serious time. We, we might need these clients. And she just went, no, like we're not doing it. And I was like, okay, well. If the youngest person in our practice says that they feel something weird or not right about that, then we'll take the day off. And that's, I guess that's a millennial, <laughs> a very millennial uh, way of looking at it, I guess. Yes, well, we've got a language warning from Claire. <laughs> oh, right. Yes. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I think that, that that's, that's a difficulty. I mean, the problem with uh, institutional clients is that you get a variety of personalities in, right. in any one client group mm. and um, I guess you're stuck taking the rough with the smooth. There are some people which you can never please no matter what you do of course and that's just part of the architect's lament just then so I think we'll avoid talking about that but, but um, it, it is you know we have actually tried to develop systems and protocols within our firm to deal with individuals within a client group who yep. are um, personally difficult. And um, I think it's, it's worth all firms thinking about the types of strategies they put into place 
to to deal with those issues because certainly with public authorities you are not able to avoid uh, people who are well you know narcissistic um, uh, unfair uneducated all of, all of those things you know just let's face it you can't so how do you deal with them well I think you need a plan to deal with clients who behave improperly. I think that particular statement reads into this idea of procurement. Um, I feel like in those institutions, procurement is very old fashioned and the behavior of our clients in those situations sometimes is appalling. I mean, even a lot of the practices are paying, paying really late, paying invoices really late to small companies. I've seen massive multinational companies take 90 days on a quarterly contractual invoice that they are obliged to pay. Um, I've seen fee agreements, and this happened recently with some, a project, commercial, commercial project that we were working on. The fee agreement was never signed. And so we had to have a sub fee agreement bec during the project for a small amount of money in order for the project to move forward, which means you're carrying risk I've uh, heard of that kind of thing happening. And there's also agreements and things with novation. Um, and none of these things lead to good outcomes. And so it's about the profession um, being very vocal about poor practices from our clients and saying that this just isn't acceptable as behavior. So there's yeah. two, two kind of sides to this, isn't there? There's the kind of question of what you do in a sort of day-to-day -day way when you're dealing with clients who are difficult. Um, and we've got a question from Kim Baisley about that, which I think we should go to if that's okay. And then I think there's the broader issue, which I suspect is where Alana might be coming from, which is the kind of strategic, um, you know, impacting procurement processes more broadly at a kind of strategic level. And we've got some really good questions here around government procurement processes. So it feels to me like there's a kind of two, two sides to this, but um, I thought we might um, throw to Kim quickly to ask her question about that kind of day-to-dayness of dealing with difficult clients and, and the protocols that Jeff mentioned. So Kim, our friend. Hi, I, I was just after a bit more detail. It sounded very interesting that protocols that you said that you've set up, Jeff, and just how they work. Um, just if you could just be a bit more specific, I guess. Okay, well, it, specifically, if, if we find that people are uh, being difficult clients, typically we react by um, analysing what they've said. So one of our favourite tools in this is well, one, one, let, 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 let's take a specific example, because it, it must happen to lots of people. You get an institutional client and you've got uh, three, three or four people involved and they all say, all say slightly different things. And it becomes part of some internal battle as to who, who has the power to, to sign off on something. So we have this little thing, we use a Scott schedule type approach where we have the issue in question and we record what people um, say about it. So we then have a record of what they've said and when they've said it. And if people then start to change their minds, um, we can always go back to what they've said previously and say, well, actually three weeks ago, you said this and we did that. And consequently, we've now got um, 110 hours of abortive work. How would you like us to deal with that? So we, we, we are, um, I mean, it starts out with us being nice and, and trying to cope with people who are merely socially awkward, but it ends up with us in some cases having to go back and saying, look, you're, what you're doing is causing extra work and we're gonna need to charge you for that. So, but one of the things that we have done over the years is to uh, increase the amount of note taking uh, that we do. And also we use databases um, to, to record and, and um, recover information. So that, they're, they're two of the tools that we've, we've applied over the years. Kim, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that answers your your question. Yeah, no, that that's fine. It's, it sounds like basic, just sort of 
contract management, but I guess it just highlights how important that is that once you've actually got the work that you then, the way that that's managed is, you know, um, you don't lose money in the program. I mean, I've, I'm working with external consultants at the moment and um, uh, for a public authority and, and they've signed a contract before I started, um, which doesn't allow for prolongation. And that's obviously, you know, at local council level, something that happens regularly and yeah, they're really getting burnt. And I know it's difficult because I can see, see that, but it's, um, yeah, it's just, it just highlights how important those contracts that you sign um, with authorities are. And that leads back to Justine, your other question about procurement. So I'll let you get back to that. No, I feel, oh, well, I'm just, I'm just plotting in my head another session on um, dealing with difficult, you know, this kind of difficult conversation. So I think, um, which again is something that happens across all levels. So um, let's park that for another session, but I think it's a really good topic and one that I'm very interested in. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on in the chat already. And I wonder if um, we might throw to Jessica for her question about um, the relationship between the parameters that clients set and procurement models. And then there's also a good question from uh, Marshall Day Acoustics about uh, streamlining. Um, so I wonder if we go to Jessica first. Jessica, hi. Yeah, hi. Um, just for some context, so my main part of my job is doing this, basically. I just do the bids. For, I've done it for 10 years. That's the main part of my job. Um, and the biggest thing that we come up against in procurement is um, how the systems are set up by the clients. Um, so how I understand what's been said so far that, you know, it's nice to be able to um, tell the clients how it works, but a lot of the times where you're not at liberty to do that. Um, so I was just wondering if anyone has any suggestions around that, given that um, the clients, especially at government level, are setting how we actually are able to apply for jobs, you know, short listings done without us, um, you know, being on a Victorian register, the way the contracts are set up, the evaluation criteria is waiting. A lot of time you don't have an ability to um, influence it if you want to do that type of work. So I just wondered if anyone had the experience in how to, I guess, influence <laughs> um, that as, as was said earlier. Well, um, if Justin, is it okay if we make a comment? Yes, please do. So I think this is essentially why the professional associations e exist because the only people who can really con control uh, this, uh, these sort of uh, parameters are governments. So if you look at, at the city of Sydney, for instance, uh, the city of Sydney insists on architectural competitions being held before we have a significant project. That's because the city of Sydney requires this. If we look at government procurement, that happens in ways that governments mandate. So, and, and some of their procurement practices are, to put it mildly, pretty stupid because they don't advantage them and they certainly don't allow us to um, provide a pro proper professional service. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we, we need, I know John's sitting there pensively um, uh, looking at this. We, we need the ACA and the AIA to be um, focused on, on requiring government to procure things in a way which both advantages them and also leaves room for, for the profession to operate properly. And, and nobody else can really do that. I mean, it's, it's exactly why we have um, an institute and, and, and the ACA. That's, that's their primary role, I think. Um, I might chime in on that one from the ACA. I, I know uh, that the fee weighting issue is causing, you know, quite quite a bit of damage um, in the profession. And I think that there is at the moment some re there's quite a bit of research out there. Uh, and so we know that this is a problem. There is research uh, either out there or happening at the moment. So there's an article, uh, sorry, a, a, um, a research paper by Paul Tilley that's cost cutting leads to poor value and it's by the CSIRO that's talking all about the issues with, you know, um, substandard documentation and how much that causes problems down the line. And there's a, there's a financial argument here that if you, you know, you're only robbing Peter to pay Paul down the track. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we do have, 
we do have that research. We do have that information. It's just that we as a profession need to get that in front of the people that are making the decisions about contracts. I mean, if the government can turn around and release an immense amount of money for JobKeeper, <laughs> why can we not pay people properly on government projects? I mean, mm. it, it, makes, it makes no sense in terms of the financial discussion from government that's all about supporting small business or business in, in general and getting the economy going to be doing this. Um, we do, I think at the ACA, I know that we've, we've actually started in WA writing letters when we see or hear from our members about um, appalling procurement practices, um, which is, you know, not very powerful, um, but we're working our way through that. And I believe that there's actually research being done by Peter Raysbeck at the moment, who's um, part of the ACA's research division. So, you know, it is happening. It's just uh, making, we just, I think the next step is potentially marketing that information. And I don't just mean advocating at government level, I mean getting it into papers, um, you know, flooding the media with it and, and it being a major topic of discussion because it's so important. I agree. Oh, I thought it might be a good moment to ask Kate, and how, what about in the residential space? Where is where it's the majority of your work? What sort of and you do have the capacity to influence procurement because the clients come to you kind of blind, not really knowing about the design process. Often, what sort of interesting procurement models have you been involved with, or non-traditional methods to bring about buildings? Um, it's a it's a fascinating thing for my practice at the moment to be um, seeing the impact of the stimulus on on uh, lots of of young people who really want to renovate their house and, you know, Oh, Whispering Smith, we love you. Love your work. Um, you know, we've got a hundred thousand dollars and we want to add an extension and put a second story on and all these kind, you know, this major economic misunderstandings about how much building costs and how to procure it. Uh, and a lot of them, you know, we try and call every single one of those people and advise them on, the price per square metre of construction right down from project home level right up to high end architecture, uh, the time that it takes, um, the kind of things that they're you know, going to need or are looking for, because it's not always possible for people to hire an architect to just financially. Um, there's terrific building designers out there. There's one of the things that we have looked at um, as part of a brand that we're developing called New Resident, which is designed to produce ready-made architecture. So we're delivering that um, as house and land packages. So we would become the developer. Uh, it's kind of like Nightingale. I think that's an alternative procurement me uh, method. You get a whole bunch of people who really want to invest in a better outcome, don't want a project home, but maybe they don't want a custom designed one-off architectural prototype either. Uh, they just want something that's well designed. And so we think that by controlling the economic uh, situation that people are getting their housing from. So for example, if someone buys a block of land in the middle ring in Perth, usually it's been subdivided by someone and that person has taken the profit out of that project straight away. So the person who buys that block of land often buys, uh, it's, it's been subdivided the wrong way. It doesn't, you know, the blocks could face north, but they don't or, you know, things like that because it's all about economics, the supply of land. Um, and then all the trees and everything get bulldozed because, you know, this person's just a land developer. They're not interested in uh, working around trees and existing buildings and things like that. So if we can take that supply of land, buy it, and then do the subdivision ourselves and put the profit from that land into the actual development, just like Nightingale is doing, um, we can actually deliver high quality housing at a lower cost. And instead of that person buying a block of land that's small, that's got $100,000 worth of profit in it, they can then put that $100,000 into our face and into sustainable technology. So uh, it's a different way of doing things, but um, it's just when architects are sort of learning about business and, and, and trying to understand, you know, if we were a goldfish, the water that we're swimming in and how can we manage or make that water a bit better? So there's a kind of, there's, again, there's a sort of double side to this. It's on the one hand, developing new and innovative 
procurement, which I think we want to talk about more. And then there's how we kind of shift government along. And, and I mean, Kate, you described gov many government procurement processes as feeling old fashioned, but my feeling is they seem to be, my, certainly the impression I get is they're getting worse. If they were old fashioned, they'd probably be quite good. <laughs> And I wondered if um, we might go to John. John, how do you want to, you've got a comment here about um, expertise within government and the, the kind of growing lack of expertise. Um, and of course, you can also speak to the ACA's advocacy. So again, how do we improve things rather than how do we complain about them? <laughs> uh, I was just in the middle of typing something related to um, the similarities between what architects go through and, and subcontractors and particularly specialist subcontractors who have a f much more voice and power but get cut out of decent procurement often even if the procurement's good in the first place um, at the top tier sort of once by the time you get down to the second or third tier um, they're the people who suffer um, with, with poor contracting and by the time you get down to the guy with the dog and the ute, they're the ones who go broke if the uh, if the procurement um, is set up in this sort of adversarial and risk shifting way. The risk is always shifted down to the bottom of the pile. So uh, I think there's some really interesting conversations happening at the moment around procurement between architects and the subcontract industry. Um, and to push back up, particularly to governments. Um, there, is a, there is an organisation called the Australian Procurement and Construction Council, which in the past has sort of said, oh, everyone's got to have skin in the game, you know, we, we've got all these new fangled ways of doing our procurement. When you hear them talk now, I think it's a little different. They're realising, you know, the DNC isn't the magic answer to everything. Um, so, there's one thing. Um, I, um, I acknowledge the CSIRO stuff, but it's nearly 20 years old now. It needs to be updated. And uh, the difficulty in is, is just the need for this really detailed research on fees and outcomes and quality. And, you know, we've got a big, um, we've got a big sort of leg up from, for example, the, um, uh, the Shogold Weir report in just in terms of how um, poor procurement has led to really poor outcomes, which actually cost people their life savings. I mean, that's, that's a different level of, of, um, of uh, uh, risk that, that nobody sort of factored into anything. So um, we need the research, but we also need the funds to be able to do the research. And that's, I guess, we're... Um, as ACA, we are desperately trying to to work out just how we can get the really good evidence that so we can go back to governments. And once governments do it, then hopefully, you know, the big institutional clients will see the error of their ways and work better um, um, on all this stuff. So, Jeff, as somebody who has been working in kind of public sector education, you know, kind of, as you said at the start, a range of kind of fields, but, but not, not mostly private clients, mostly kind of public clients of some kind, would I be right to say? Right. Um, have you seen, um, I mean, is, where's the, look, I mean, obviously we just, we great to just change the way all governments do things, but that's a kind of long-term project that we all should be working on, but it's a, it's a slow project. So um, I wondered if you, had examples of kind of innovative procurement within those kinds of client groups that that are worth pointing to or and i suppose i have another question which is about non-conforming bids and whether they're useful um which uh, again i've got some well, the, the, maybe i'll park that for the minute but but justine there's all sorts of innovation but it's not necessarily um good i mean we, we've seen public sector authorities experiment with all sorts of different ways of procurement and um, most of them end up in some sort of novation um, delivery type system um, but they're mostly driven by um, folklore there's not you know there's not a lot of evidence i think john's comment about evidence is is a very valid one um, that we just we we don't 
have a good evidence base. We've got lots and lots of anecdotes. I'm sure everyone here has, has got anecdotes about procurement systems that have delivered appalling outcomes. And my favourite example is the new Royal Adelaide Hospital, which, which um, you, know, you know, was procured by the state government through a clever arrangement with a finan financier and, and, you know, a consortium of builders and architects and engineers and everyone else. And this was, this ended up in essentially in a disaster. So I think, you know, we, we did, we, we've got a lot of work to do. We've had a lot of work to do since 1974 in a, in, in a way, but I think John's comment is also correct that, um, that we've got a better chance of getting traction with this now that people have seen the results of poor design practices, poor um, site practices, which are driven by the absence of anyone with any experience. And I'd also like to pick up on Kate's proposition, which is that architects can be developers. And ever since John Portman um, developed hotels in the 60s and 70s in the US, we've sort of known that this has been the case. But uh, if you go to the average architecture school and uh, talk to people about how many um, of the staff have experience of development, yeah. you, you tend to get a sequence of, of rather blank looks, I'm afraid. So we, we, we probably need to, to think about, very carefully about both of those issues. Um, we, you know, the, the, the remarkably few project managers come from an architectural background. And that, that is remarkable. So we get people who've done uh, an engineering degree or in some cases, a land economics degree, um, which might've taken them three years. They've done a 20 week project management course. And there they are telling all of us how to do things when we've been through seven years of, well, it's not hell exactly, but certainly seven years of effort to, 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 um, to become architects. So there are some real, uh, and there are, are some real problems with the industry and, and that, that certainly is one of them, having people who make decisions who've got no idea what they're doing. Mm. Alana, do you want to? Yeah, I was wondering what's the scope for practices and business owners to expand their, their service offering really? to expand into more non non traditional methodologies or kind of beyond beyond typical architectural services maybe a little bit more consulting that something like arena does and c taking away as many hurdles from the process that what can we execute some agency onto well for us we were, we we became more involved on Client, the client side of projects after um, the local government sector got uh, in inverted commas better at procurement during the 90s. And their version of getting better was to get people to do community centres for a fee of 1.8%. And we just thought that that was, was, I think Kate would agree, it's, it's all ridiculous. So we just said, no, we're not gonna do that. Um, so we invented another role for ourselves where we could, we could leverage our IP and expertise to, to make a decent living. And I think that's, that's really a challenge for, for all of us. It's a challenge for us now because our particular little niche has been disrupted by a pandemic, but there you go. Um, but we, we all need to be good at thinking about how we could use our architectural skills, which are considerable, to, to, to do things which will not just be good for the built environment, but also make as a profession. Now, as a profession, we need to make enough profit so that we can not only invest in systems to deliver projects, but we can also mentor the following generation. So if we don't have enough profit and we can't spend time with uh, graduates and so on, 
then we're not going to perpetuate ourselves as a, as a profession. And that, that's, that's incredibly important. I think we, we have a generation of, of, of architects now who've never been closely supervised by an experienced person because the fees, particularly for things like multi-unit res, are on the floor. And, and that, that, that's, it's, it's unsustainable. We, we cannot have an architectural profession where people can't, don't have the time to spend um, with, with younger members of the profession. Kate, do you have anything to add to this? Or? I was just reading that last question, um, sort of about the traditional, traditional practice of architecture. Um, I've, I've, always, I've always found architecture to be, um, I read, well, I read once that it's, a, it's one of the most exciting professions because it looks back as much as it looks forward. Um, and I think that that, you know, we were just talking about Palladio earlier in this conversation about procurement. And we're talking about sort of modern 1.8% methods of procuring buildings. Um, and I find that one of the things that is the most surprising to me is that we still, as a profession, we swap time for money. And whether you do it percentage or you track hourly or you, you know, what, however you you work through that, we, we package up our time into little increments and we sell it out, uh, kind of like a lawyer or an accountant. Um, and it's sort of this idea that, that design isn't valued. It's because it's invisible. It's because it's packaged up into tiny little hours and no one can see uh, behind that screen of, of what we do. But one of the, I mean, one of the things that we're experimenting with New Resident is selling architecture as a product. So we, it, we just put a price on that thing at the end and say, here it all is in one package. We can deliver you a sustainable house in the mid 700,000s in the middle ring of Perth or in this suburb because the median of the land is lower to, for us to purchase at the beginning. Um, and then a person can either buy or not buy that product. And so it, it's completely different when you're talking about government procurement. Um, but at the same time, it is a constant battle to explain how long things take and that we need to be paid for that time. And so I think the very notion that we track and sell time for money is one of our, one of our things. And we just need more clear communicating and marketing the value of that time in, you know, in the media. I mean, we're doing, we're here talking to each other today, which is terrific. Uh, <laughs> but I would really like to see us talk <laughs> you know, in the age or in the guardian or one of those um, kind of, you know, platforms. Well, some of the other speakers that Alana and I talked about for this topic were um, for outside of architecture. So I think, um, I think there's legs on more than one session on this. So we'll keep going. Um, there's so many comments in, in the um, discussion here. Um, Emily, I just wonder if you might put your warning about the way we procure the services of others. Here's Emily. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm stuck here in my bad Melbourne lack of haircut for six months. That's why I got my camera off. Uh, well, yes. Um, yeah, so I'm an architect, but I'm also a landscape architect. So I've been educated to think and as like the archit architecture is the master of the arts and all of that stuff. And that comes through really, really clearly when you're hearing it from the other side of the table as another profession. It, sound, it can sound incredibly arrogant and we can sit in these forums and talk about how no one, no one values us, no one understands what we do, no one understands how much time it takes, no one's prepared to value it and pay the money for it and then we turn around and do the exact same thing to others. So we take that approach that um, if we're hiring someone and, and I see this quite a bit in, in the residential space but also in commercial space, that if we need to um, have another consultant on the, on the team, it comes across as, but we've already done the design and we just need somebody to figure out the bracing. We just need somebody to pick the plants. We just need someone to write up the planning application. And we do exactly the same thing that we accuse other people of doing to us, of not valuing the years of training, the years of experience, the years of everything. So I think it's just, um, worth being mindful of that as well. 
can we take that as a comment? I'm it's a comment. <laughs> and I wonder if the, who, who's here from Marshall Day Acoustics? There's some pretty good comment here. There's a, there's a question about streamlining between states and shortlisting right at the back. And then there's a newish one. I've lost it now. Anyway, Marshall Day, who are you? Where are you? It's me. It's Amanda. Uh, <laughs> we share an account, so I don't like to come up as Christophe Delaro. <laughs> Marshall Day, it makes it easier. Um, I was taught by Professor Marshall back in the day. Anyway, keep going. Um, no, it's just in terms of like every, and maybe it should have been not just across states, um, but within the state every local council has their own form of contract that they use and measure the process against. And then you go into state and it's a whole different set of rules. Um, and we see a lot of clauses that we know have been borrowed from a very specific scenario that crop up in these things and nobody clearly has an understanding of where they've come from. It's just been cut and paste from elsewhere. So is there, you know, a bit like there is an Australian standard 4122, you know, is there a contract that we can just give to these councils and say, why not use this? Let's, let's simplify it. And why does it have to be different in every state? Hmm. So innovation might not, you know, I think this is the question that I, I think, Alana, you're trying to get to is, is, is what else can we do given that these systems don't work? And so in, in one, and that might be about, as Kate's talking about, a completely different approach, but it might also just be about you know, where we can kind of put pressure on the systems where you can, um, or where you can kind of offer alternatives. And Kim, I think you've also said something about um, coming up with good contracts and which seems to build on what um, our friend from Marshall Day was saying. Um, and, and then of course, John's telling us the horrible history of good contracts that get worked out and then torpedoed by others. So, um, Again, maybe we'll just take all of those as comments. Alana, where do you want to go? I'm feeling bamboozled by the fantastic <laughs> amount of discussion going on. No, um, Jeff, in, in reading a lot of your commentary um, and great articles in the conversation, actually, um, you, you always talk about or advocate for an independent, an independent assessor, an independent certifier during construction, and especially during... Um, well, in multi-res with all the, with all the de defects and problems that occur and the issues that occur down the line as a result. So how, how do you see an independent assessor mo model working and who might be to implement that? Well, the obvious uh, person or the obvious group is uh, are architects. I mean, every state uh, registers architects. They have to have insurance. They've been trained. Um, and they're the, the obvious people to do this role. Um, quite why we don't have, um, have a rush for people wanting architects to do this role is, is a question I can't, I can't really answer. Uh, Could you perhaps, sorry, just explain a little bit about how, what is this role that we're asking for? Well, I think one of the things that's happened over the past 30 years really is we've been, for multi unit res, for instance, we're now focused on a design and construct methodology, which means that the builder is the one to take the lead um, during the construction process. And that's, um, that's, I think, been the root cause of many of the problems we've had with uh, multi-unit res, particularly uh, multi-unit res over four stories, uh, over three stories high, so tall multi-unit res. And you know, in New South Wales, for instance, if you do a building of this type, you're required to employ an architect to design it, but that's it. There's no requirement for the architect to produce documents, uh, to produce documents of any standard, to be involved in the construction process, to approve substitutions, to do any of the other things that are really necessary to make, make sure that this type of project stays on track. And that that's that's an opportunity i think and you know john uh, would may may have a comment on this but this is a real opportunity for architects to to get back involved in doing the things that they used to do 
I mean, a couple of years ago, um, I spoke to somebody in what was then a major uh, significant Australian office with, with architectural office with, with um, branches in, in every state. And they had never done uh, in the past four years, they had never done a lump sum contract and administered that on site. So essentially none of their younger architects had ever had the experience of going onto site and inspecting what was going on. So, and so in other words, none of them had had the opportunity for the older members of the firm to teach them what to look at. So if, if, if that opportunity arose again, you know, people like John and I, who've gone through this, this uh, cauldron uh, of dealing with builders on sites, we'll just be too old. And we, you know, we won't be able to pass on these skills. So I think we've, we've got to make sure that we can, we can uh, retain these skills um, before it's too late. Um, that, that's one of my current concerns. Would the developer or the contractor be responsible for hiring an independent assessor under such a model? Look, I think people should be uh, forced into this by legislation. And, and I think there's, there's obvious uh, issues with around the procurement of those people and, and how much you pay them and, and so on. Somebody has to pay for this. But I would argue at the moment that it's actually cheaper to build things correctly the first time round than building them with a huge number of, of defects and then asking people to sort things out afterwards. I mean, it, it really upsets me. In 2004, the, the uh, Trade Practices uh, Commission, or the Productivity Commission came up with a report talking about how it was great that the BCA opened up performance solutions to, to, um, to designers and, and builders and they calculated that, that the Australian economy would be saved billions of dollars, over a billion dollars a year by freeing up the BCA. What they didn't take into account was the cost of faults and remedial works to buildings which had failed because of people using these so-called innovative solutions. And the one that everyone thinks about, of course, is, is uh, aluminium composite panels. So if somebody had said back in about the year 2000 that these were not a suitable uh, material for the outside of a, build, of, of a tall building, um, we wouldn't have a 10 to $15 billion remedial works task in front of us now. So I think, you, you know, this, this is the stupidity of the, 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 um, uh, of the, Productivity Commission's uh, uh, report that it identified savings, but without looking at costs. Yep. And, and you know, th th this is this is where we have an opportunity. I think we can say to people, look, on a life cycle cost, we can do a better job. If we look at the BCA, the National Construction Code, it's all about first cost. We want to make sure that we deliver things uh, at the uh, in the most efficient way. There's nothing, nothing in the National Construction Code about durability or life cycle cost or sustainability or any of the things that it really ought to concern itself with. And, and that, that's something where I think we, as a profession, we really need to make a push. And a lot of those examples are part of that real mounting body of evidence. If there a question in the chat, Justine, otherwise I, I kind of have a so many fangirl questions. question for Kate. Okay. You, have a you do your fangirl question. I'm anxious we've got two minutes. You do your fangirl question. I, I, think, it's, I think it's pretty inspirational, Kate, to read about your A House project. Um, and then you won a the state level award for that as a director at 32. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you, how you brought A House into existence? and the bigger lot that that project is part of? Uh, so I did it as a development. Um, I started with Spring Smith in, in 20, 2010, 2011, when it was after the, um, 
after that major GFC recession, there were no jobs. I didn't really want to work anyway. And so I just, I went, I went through the process of saying, maybe I can, I can do some, something else. I can renovate some houses or I can, you know, use my skills as an architect in a different way. And I also felt like I didn't have enough on-site experience, Jeff, which, you know, <laughs> I now have, and it's just stood me in good stead. Um, but how say I, I partnered with my, with my parents and, um, and I, I bought a block of land and I did a and I did a project and I went right through the planning system trying to do that project as a carbon neutral sustainable development and it was impossible. You know, it was so backwards, the whole planning system to produce the kind of outcomes that we're talking that Jeff was mentioning before that aren't in the BCA, you know, durability, sustainability, all those things. They're not even mentioned in the planning system either and so where where it's that same thing about uh the mystery of what we do our you know we're sort of trying to get to here and and base level is so low uh, and and house a was about the fact that i realized that i couldn't get my clients to do to do this they were always going to be here and i wanted to do this and i had to pay for it myself to do it and, and then on, off the back of House A, we launched an entire firm. You know, I, I'd been practicing since 2011. House A came out in 2017, 18. And I'd say we were more than fivefold tripled our, you know, our business size and, and, um, and income. And, you know, now mentoring a whole bunch of other young women and, um, and doing the ACA BOSP and all those kind of things. So it was a completely different financial model to starting a practice, you know, build something yourself first and do it the way that you think is right. Uh, don't wait around for a client to believe in your vision, just do it. And, um, and then, and then go and talk about it. And that's one of the reasons why we were also the architectural consultant on the medium density planning policy that's being written at the moment, because not only do we know how to design things, but I understand all of the complexity with the the relationship between finance and the planning system and subdivision and all of those things and what the what the exact barriers are and in what order they happen when you try and do a sustainable development um and actually i don't know if many other architects have that knowledge well that, that's a fantastic um <laughs> fantastic thing to hear kate i mean a lot <laughs> of architects have done those um not necessarily with with um, your success but it, it is a valid thing for architects to do and I often used to get my students coming up and asking me sort of, oh, can I do a develop, can I become a developer? And I'd say, yeah, of course you can. Yes, of course. Can I, be a, the can, can I be a project manager? Yes, of course you can. You don't. Oh, can't. Can't. Is there a, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that looking at different ways of, of leveraging skills is, is, is certainly that's a very intelligent approach, and I'm, I'm glad it's, I'm glad it's worked out for you. Thanks, Jeff. I do. Risky. It's risky. Yeah, and I didn't. I, say, I want to point out that I didn't make money on the development. In fact, I lost it because I, you know, I was so busy trying to achieve this. Uh, and once you're in the middle of it, you're like, I've just got to hold my fire. You know, I'm going to have to see this thing through. That's a long-term, you know, proposition. Um, yeah. And there were some other things financially that you know didn't work out that way, but. Again, it's this conversation about, you know, the economic scenario is not just that one project. It's about the longevity of that situation. So, it, okay, it didn't financially stack up originally. And it's the same with procurement, you know, all right, having paying more fees to an architect, an engineer and other people in the project doesn't stack up originally, but the overall impact, it's a much bigger financial and economic discussion. And yeah, it, yes, it is. It was a success, but not if you look at the figures of the project, it absolutely wasn't. But would I do it again? Yeah, you know, you're damn right I would um, because it's, it's, it's a bigger than that project discussion. Well, the, the, look, Kate, I'm sure you'll learn from your financial experience as developers do. So often developers... You've got to lose to learn. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's true. So a lot of devel developers start out doing exactly that. They... They have successes and failures and they learn from their mistakes and they go on to, to, to do bigger and better things or bigger and worse things as, as the case may be. But I, I, I'm really impressed by that, that story. It's, it's, it's really wonderful. 
Okay. I Sorry? Did someone say something? Much as I want to keep going, because I feel like there's another hour at least in this, um, we are mindful that it is your lunch break probably. So um, we probably need to wrap it up, but we, I, I do think there's, lo there's a lot of other um, topics that have come out of this that could be standalone as well as another session on procurement. So thank you very much. There's a huge amount going on in the chat. Um, Nicolette, I really wanted to give you able to get to you, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the points Nicolette was making, though, is the architecture profession can be very snobbish about those who step sideways into um, working in other ways. And that's something I certainly agree with Nicolette. And I think I certainly believe if we are more open about what one might do with one's architectural skills and that the sort of mainstream bit of the profession is interested to learn from those who've gone sideways, uh, there might be a lot to gain. Um, and I think uh, I think Fiona Gray, someone else I would like to have heard from, but um, next time. Um, so uh, what I do want to do is give the last word to Tanya Davidge, who has um, completely given up and gone off piece and is texting me. So <laughs> Tanya, give us your rousing argument for being a good architectural citizen. Oh God, um, <laughs> hang on, where is it, where have I put it? Sorry, I did go off paste. <laughs> um, I've just been thinking about articulating value because that's something I always said that we need to be better at. But I'm currently thinking at the moment that we need to think even a little bit beyond that. And we need to be, we need to think about what it means to be. And perhaps we also need to be taught a little bit more about being a good architectural citizen um, because a lot of the problems that we're facing come from people who are maybe being not as good at being architectural citizens um, as the rest of us. So what does it mean to act and advocate collectively? I think we've heard during this talk, which was fantastic, um, that government has a huge role to play, but we need to know how to talk to government and we need to advocate um, up to government from our respective positions and how we do that, I think is really important. So maybe we all need to get together and have a collective think about that. Thank you, Tanya. Can I, can I just say <laughs> something, just, just one sure. thing about that, which is one thing that governments won't listen to is architects' reasons why we should do it the architect's way. So you can't approach a liberal with a labor argument, if you like. We need to think about things that we can tell governments which will advantage them. And we've been very good about telling them about us, you know, the Arctic's lament, Justine and, and so on. But we need to, to think about what, what's in it for them and then really work hard on, on those things. Right. I mean, I think, look, one thing that's, you know, a great thing about the chat too, we've got the ACA talking in the chat, we've got RP team talking about the research Peter race that's been doing. We've got Nicolette talking about the work that the Institute's doing. So all of our representative bodies are trying to do stuff and we just hope that they, I know they're talking to each other. I hope they are working collectively as well. I think they probably are. Um, certainly the people who are representing them who are here are. Hope they're doing that at a broader level. Um, and I completely agree, Jeff. You, this is the conversation last week about communication. You have to know who your audience is and how to get to talk to them. We're going to have to wrap it up. I'm going to hand over to Alana for the last word um, and also maybe to say a little bit about Midday Monday, which is our um, uh, event that we have for students and grads every second Monday. There's one coming up this Monday. So, Alana. Yeah, that, that event's run by students Sarah Mayer and Bronwyn Main. Um, and it mostly has students and graduates in attendance and goes into breakout rooms. And I'm helping moderate that on Monday as well. So come along and meet some people. I'm always talking about how good it is. I thought it was good to have someone who's actually been in one of those Zoom rooms talk about how good it was. Do you want to wrap up the topic, Alana, or should we just say goodbye to everyone? I think we should let him go. It's already, exactly. we're already probably running late. Hopefully see everybody back for part two. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And onwards and upwards. And I talk about the architect's limit with love. <laughs>